Good morning, everybody across the United States, and welcome to uh, Ide Bailey's uh, first of three parts of our transition uh, webinar series. My name is Art Wiederman. Uh, I'm a dental, di dental division director for the CPA firm of Ide Bailey. I've been a dental CPA for 38 years. I'm also a dental practice broker. I've done that for about 17 years. And um, this is really important information and I'm really glad you've joined us today. Um, so we have a three part webinar series on transitions. We're gonna start today with my good friend, uh, attorney Pat Wood, and I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, we have we have the three-part webinar series, and we also have our Business of Dentistry series. So I want to give you some dates to kind of mark on your calendar. Um, so November 4th, we're going to be doing our uh, second Business of Dentistry webinar, which is going to be with the Dental A Team, Kira Dents Group, um, Total Practice Makeover, inclu uh, Increasing uh, Productivity um, in Your Dental Practice. And then... Uh, the next Friday, all of these, by the way, are on Friday mornings, 9 a.m. if you want to attend live, 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, which is 10 a.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Uh, Central, and noon uh, on the East Coast. So on November 11th, I'm going to do a webinar with Dr. Bogdan Madurowicz and with Justin Klingstern from <laughs> Bank of America. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, nuts and bolts of buying and selling a dental practice. We'll let Counselor Wood handle the legal stuff today. Um, we're then going to, on December the 9th, have Kathleen Johnson, who's probably done well over 1,000 uh, management due diligence engagements all over the country as a dental consultant, talk to you guys about, you know, what on the management side does this look like? What should you as a seller be doing to get your practice ready for sale? Buyers, what should you be looking at to determine is this the right practice for you? Um, I also wanna thank, uh, take a minute and thank the eight dental societies here in Southern California who have been kind enough to sponsor and promote uh, this webinar for their members. Uh, folks, uh, your local dental societies, whether you're in Southern California or anywhere else in the country, uh, do an incredible job of helping you to be successful. And please lean on them if you have issues uh, with anything in your practice. So I want to thank uh, Lee Adishian from the San Gabriel Valley Dental Society, Greg Orloff from the Los Angeles Dental Society, Kurt Thornton from the San Fernando Valley Dental Society, Megan Francis from the Orange County Dental Society, uh, Michelle uh, Schneider from the West Los Angeles Dental Society, Kristen Avina from the Harbor Dental Society, Laura Peterson from the Tri-County Dental Society, and from the Santa Barbara Ventura Dental Society, Linda Lacuzna. So I wanna thank all of our executive directors for everything that you do to help our dentists to be successful. So we're gonna start off today. Oh, I, I, I forgot uh, one other webinar I want you to mark down. December the 2nd uh, is gonna be, I'm gonna be doing a webinar with um, Mel Schwarz from I Bailey's National Tax Office. Um, and Mel and I are going to talk about year-end tax planning and what are they doing, what are they not doing, indexing of rates and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we never know what the government's going to do, and that's why I've had a job for almost 40 years. So please join us for all of these. Um, again, once we're done with this, a couple of the housekeeping things, once we're done with the webinar, you will get a, an email from us probably sometime next week with a link to this if you wanna watch it again. Um, and it will live on our Eyed Belly uh, YouTube page, which is uh, on our website, www.eyedbelly.com. Um, I'm not gonna be doing much talking this morning. And for those of you who know me, that's very difficult for me to deal with. So I'll just let you know if you guys wanna get a hold of me and have any broker questions or CPA questions, my number is 657. 279-3243 and my email is a Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at idebailey.com. So I would like to introduce uh, our speaker and my very good friend, uh, Pat Wood. And whenever I get the honor and privilege of introducing Pat, I always use the analogy of, for you doctors, for my general dentists on this call, 
I use the analogy of you probably have a periodontist, an endodontist, an ortho, oral surgeon, orthodontist, prosthodontist, all your specialists uh, that is your go-to person. In other words, you have a case that's really, really difficult and you're struggling with how to handle it. You work together with your go-to specialist. Pat Wood is my go-to attorney. Um, he has been a dental attorney for 40 years, as you can see up there, well, 38, I guess. Um, he's uh, very experienced. And, 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 and the great thing about when I call Pat, he just always seems to have the right answer. He always knows how to handle stuff. So um, Pat is going to walk you through all of the legal issues. We are going to spend a good, uh, a decent part or of the, of the webinar at the beginning talking about what do DSOs look like? Uh, if you're a buyer, uh, if you're a seller of a dental practice, you may have been approached, you may have heard from your friends, hey, maybe I should sell my practice to a DSO. What does that look like? So uh, without any further ado, and, and again, one more thing, guys, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. I will monitor them. If we get three or four questions about the same topic, I will jump in uh, and uh, maybe we'll throw that in in the middle, but we're gonna save our questions for the end because as you know, in webinars, if you just keep answering questions, you never get through the material. So that's correct. Uh, Counselor Wood, uh, Pat Wood, uh, thank you for joining us today. And um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Art. And hello to you all. Um, yes, I have been doing this for a little while. Um, 38 years, actually. Um, and uh, we have represented over 8,000 dentists uh, during that time. Um, I have two partners now. Um, they are uh, equally, basically all we do is we represent dentists and doctors. And so you're talking to the right people if uh, you're going to buy or sell or you have any, any issue whatsoever, dental board, medical board, um, we do all of that work. So uh, by all means, feel like you can call us. I can call it. Uh, you see the phone number there, 800-499-1474. So feel free to call me um, and I'll be happy to take it and try to um, give you the best advice I can. Um, I am going to, unfortunately, I, I cannot uh, move the slides. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask Stacy if she could move the slide onto our first one, which is DSOs. Now, DSOs are really important to you, in my mind, because uh, it, whether you're a buyer or a seller, um, you're, you're going to hear at least somebody that got approached by a DSO. And whether the DSO, you know, we do it all over the country. Uh, I've probably done DSOs in 35 uh, states. Uh, and so it, the, the way that they do it is going to be different depending on the state that you're with. Um, I'm going to try to keep what I say today restricted to California. Uh, if somebody has a question and they want to ask me at the end, how do you do it? And Another state, I'd be happy to uh, do my best to answer that. Um, what are DSOs? Typically, they're companies that provide management support to the dentist. Um, they are uh, uh, basically in charge of the non-clinical aspects of the practice. Uh, you've probably seen some of these names. Heartland is the biggest. Aspen is uh, very big. Pacific Dental, which uh, is in Orange County, has 850 uh, uh, practices. Uh, <clears throat> you're going to find, and, and uh, you know, I haven't updated this thing um, in a few years, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to update it as I go. But uh, this is something that is going to impact you, in my opinion, if you are trying to acquire a practice. And especially if you have a thriving practice and you're looking at selling it, um, there are uh, some some things that all these guys are looking for. And so we'll try to go through that. <clears throat> Next. Uh, are they legal? In most states, they are. There are a couple where they've made it extremely uh, difficult to operate as a uh, <clears throat> DSO. 
Um, if you, if, what we do basically is we have familiarized ourselves with the Dental Practice Act in each of the states that we go in. And then we also look at the enabling uh, statutes uh, that allow for those things. And generally, if you know how to look for these things, you're going to find it. <clears throat> I will say, don't call the dental boards because they're generally not very uh, happy about uh, uh, DSOs. Okay, next. So in order uh, for a DSO to be legal, and this pretty much, uh, th th these are requirements that are pretty uh, much uh, in every state. Um, you wanna enter into a management agreement. Now, what the management agreement says is that the DSO is in charge of, uh, at the doctor's uh, discretion, uh, of everything that goes on in the front office. Um, they get paid a fee for what they do. It's going to vary depending on who you're doing business with. Um, it can, in California, it cannot be uh, payment of profit. Uh, you cannot pay profit to DSOs. You can, however, pay them based upon how much uh, the, the, the practice uh, has billed and, and received. Um, generally, I mean, I, I've, I've heard certain people say, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I own this DSO and I, I make 20 percent on it every year. I, you know, I, I'm not really sure what they make. I can just tell you what they say. Um, you, the, but the main thing for you is you as the dentist have to be in charge of what's going on in the back room. Next. So. I did this thing back in about uh, 2015. We had a, a seminar down at the Hotel Dell in San Diego. And uh, I talked to people um, at Shine and Patterson. I talked to, we actually had uh, one of the DSOs there. Uh, they gave a, a, a discussion. Um, these numbers are, are not current. Uh, I would say basically, uh, you probably have about 20% of all dental practices in the country that are uh, essentially DSOs, uh, where you have a DSO that owns everything but the dental records. And, and by the way, that is how they have to be set up. You cannot have a DSO owning the, the uh, records that has to be owned by you, the dentist. Um, I would say... You plan on 20%, and I, and I hate to say it, but this number is just going to go up. It's not going down. Uh, these guys are making good money, and uh, uh, they've been discovered by Wall Street, and they are uh, going to continue to grow and grow. <clears throat> Next. <clears throat> so you may have noticed that uh, if you just got out of dental school, that there were probably more females than males that were there uh, learning your, your craft. Um, that is kind of what's happening. Um, what we found, we've, we've looked at this. Uh, we found that the female dentist uh, generally doesn't want to be a practice owner. Um, they'd rather be an associate. They, you know, they obviously have other things going on, such as having children. Um, and, uh, um, 80 80% 80 of the people that are out there um, that are doing, uh, uh, that, that are in uh, the dental schools, and we lecture in five schools. Uh, so we're fairly current um, on just what the, the schools are, are doing. Uh, I, I would say um, in my, classes I did this year and last year, and generally it was <laughs> by doing it uh, through the uh, internet like we're doing today, <clears throat> I would say it's about 80% that are, are saying, you know, I don't really want to own a practice. I'd rather just go somewhere and work. Um, and that is, in fact, uh, a, a, a statistic uh, that seems to be growing. Um, I have a very old uh, debt uh, in 2011, the average debt for a dental school graduate who went to a private school was 
2,000, uh, 213,000. That figure, I just uh, looked at the ADA website on it, uh, and that figure is closer to 300,000. Now, if you're getting out of school and you owe $300,000, you want to make some money and you want to make it quick. Um, and so uh, next, Stacy, thanks. <laughs> So, you know, if you're coming out of school and you've got all this debt that you have to pay off, uh, you really want to get it paid off as quickly as you can. And I will tell you that if you go to work for a uh, DSO owned practice, you are going to make more money. You're going to see more patients. Uh, you're going to do less in the way of management, which is a good thing. Um, you're not going to have to do marketing. You're not going to have to get overly involved in collecting, uh, you're really there to do uh, business, um, uh, you know, with your patients. Uh, next. So we've seen that the, uh, the DSOs are growing uh, in 2018. 20% uh, of the people out there were DSO owned. Um, there was an article that uh, ADA did they did this probably in 2014, uh, and they had two sides. They had the guys saying, oh, yeah, dentistry is going to be the way it's always been. It's always going to be owned by a, a dentist. Uh, we're not going to have management in it. And so those those two took that position. Uh, the other two that wrote uh, articles, uh, they said that by 2025, uh, they felt that 50 percent of all dental practices would be owned by uh, the DSOs that we're talking about. Now, I don't think we're going to hit that since it's 2022. Um, I'm certain we're going to hit 25%. Um, you know, you're, you're just, there's just a great wave of people that are running these things and they're running them well and they're making money. And um, I probably get two phone calls a week from people all over the country, actually all over North America. Um, I'll tell you about one in a minute that I'm working on uh, involving a, a, actually the biggest uh, uh, DSO in Mexico. Um, so these figures, uh, you could just update these things. Uh, uh, these things are uh, much bigger than the numbers uh, that were here in 2018. Next. So here are some of your dent dental uh, competition. Um, of course, we have Pacific Dental Services who are uh, located here, but they actually operate in about 25 states. Uh, we've got Heartland Dental, which is by far the biggest one. Uh, they are probably in 35 states. Um, uh, Aspen uh, is, is a big one. They're in 25 to 30 states. Uh, these are, um, uh, you know, all, all of these are uh, good practices from the standpoint of if you go to work there, you're probably going to get paid what you thought you'd get paid. Um, uh, it's a little different when you're the seller, and we'll talk about that when we get to our actual case studies. Next. So uh, there are different practice modalities out there. Probably most of you that are listening today uh, work in a solo practice uh, where you own and control everything. You're responsible for all the debt. Uh, you have to pay everybody. Um, you are making money, hopefully 35 to 40% is what uh, uh, Art tells me uh, you should be making. Um, you might be in a partnership. But there's nothing wrong with a partnership. I have two partners and we've gotten along famously for uh, one of them is my son. And he's he's been with me since he got out of law school 17 years ago. Uh, our newest partner has been with us about three years. Uh, he's been a, uh, an attorney for 10 years. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, if you're operating in a partnership, hopefully it's the kind of partnership that you never, ever have to look at the partnership agreement. You just operate as normal people. And because when you're looking at the partnership agreement, 
you're probably going to have problems going on and you don't really want to be looking at it and trying to devise, how, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, then we start getting into the small group practice and that can, may or may not be a DSO. Um, it could just be a collection of den dentists uh, having, you know, they've gotten together and they're sharing profits. Um, and then you get to the, the, the large group practice, which is the DSOs. And generally, the, the, the biggest ones are going to be located in a lot of states. Um, the, the smaller ones, the ones that are just getting going, are probably not going to be. Uh, next, next slide. Okay, the um, the upside to corporate dentistry is they you do get paid out of school more than you would if you're going to work for uh, a regular dentist. Uh, they have some pretty, I think they're they're exceptional, at least the ones that I've gone to. Uh, the way that they'll put the dentist through uh, a week or more of practice, uh, they'll actually have them seeing patients. Um, they, they try to train them to uh, get good patient uh, acceptance. Um, they try to try to um, emphasize, they emphasize teaching uh, uh, how to get case acceptance. Um, you, in my opinion, you know, I've done this for a long time. Uh, if it came down to hiring somebody that worked for a big DSL, versus somebody that uh, did not, uh, I'd probably go with the DSL. I'd want to look at what their production reports had been, et cetera. But um, somebody that has been has gone through a DSL training, and usually they'll have a week of training, and then in six months, they'll do another week of training uh, until they feel that the dentist has come uh, as far as uh, he or she can. Um, but it's, in my opinion, it's a great way uh, to get to be a good dentist quicker. quicker. Next. Downside. There is certainly a, a downside to this. I, I give you an example. I was giving a lecture in Phoenix and uh, it was whatever they called it. It was four or five states uh, that belong, not California, but, but other states. Uh, and uh, one, one person, um, she said that her brother uh, had gone to work in a DSO uh, and her husband had started his own practice. And I said, wow, that's that. And I, of course, I knew who the DSO was. And actually, the I, I figured out that I actually had set up that DSO. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, I thought that the guy should be fairly happy working there. Uh, what he had to say, the guy working in the DSO, is that uh, he had to refer everything any, anytime you had oral surgery, you had uh, pedo, anything that was outside of uh, the gen general dentistry had to be referred to somebody else in, within their organization. They could bill at a higher rate, obviously, and that's kind of what what uh, I think uh, has them doing it that way. Um, you, you work more hours when you're working in a DSO uh, at doing dentistry. Uh, you're not doing billing and other things. Uh, you, you can't be real independent. Um, uh, it's pretty much of a, you know, come in five days uh, a week. Um, now, I've heard people, uh, my friend Earl Douglas, who is from now he's from France, actually, uh, but Earl practiced for a long time in Atlanta and uh, is selling practices actually from, from France. Um, and he is of the opinion that you make a lot more money as a solo practice owner. Um, I looked at his stats. I'm not sure that I quite agreed with him. Uh, he seems he sees the light at the end of the tunnel where you get the big payday. Uh, but you also get a payday from a uh, uh, going to work for a DSO. Um, some of the things people aren't wild about is that they have to upsell the patients on different things. Uh, you may have people pushing patients to do things that 
maybe you'd look at it and say, you know, they, they really don't need that. Or if they need that, it's probably going to be years from now. Um, so, you know, j just be aware that uh, there are some downsides uh, to joining corporate dentistry. Next. Okay, so I'm going to take you through four different case studies. Uh, this first one is uh, involves Pacific Dental. Uh, and they they own about 850 uh, practices. Um, the way they do it is Pacific Dental uh, will set up a partnership between the doctor who owns the practice and the, themselves, uh, where that partnership provides the management. And typically it's, you know, uh, the DSO that's actually doing the uh, hard work of managing the practice and the dentist is in the back room uh, doing what you guys do so well. Um, they always have 51% ownership. They will not drop down to 50 or 49 because they want to be able to control everything. Um, they then contract with the with that same doctor who owns the practice. Um, generally, Pacific Dental uh, does these practices uh, as startups. Um, they find an area that they feel is not properly uh, being serviced, uh, and they'll start it there. Uh, generally, they uh, their the size of their practices will be between eight and twelve operatories. Um, they do a really good job, in my opinion, of uh, bringing in uh, the, the best equipment they can get. Uh, I know, generally speaking, every one of them uh, uh, you know, has, uh, uh, well, not everyone, uh, probably every other one probably has uh, the high, highest end of equipment um, so that they can sell you without having to send you out to somebody. Um, they they charge a nine percent fee they themselves uh it's nine percent based on how much the practice is receiving uh and then the partnership which is between the uh, dentist and the uh P pds uh you know they can charge between 24 and 32 percent i would say they probably average about 20 percent that they actually collect um which is pretty good, frankly. Um, they, they do all, their, their big lender is Bank of the West. Uh, however, Bank of the West does not uh, supply all the money. Uh, instead, kind of like title companies where uh, they might have a hundred million dollar deal and they want to get have other people to kind of share the, you know, what, what happens if things go wrong. Uh, they'll they'll uh, outsource a little bit of it or a lot, depending on where they are, uh, so that other, other uh, dental lenders are uh, going to be on, on the hook uh, if the thing fails. Um, next. Okay, this is... Um, by the way, um, I just finished two of the PDS deals in the last month. Uh, I probably do four or five a year for them, but I've been doing it forever. Um, this one uh, is uh, different in that uh, I represent the, the two owners of the uh, Indo practice. Uh, they've got about three locations. Uh, they're located not in a kind of... A, they're not in, in a big, uh, heavily populated area of Texas. Um, they were offered uh, $4,800,000 for the three practices. Now, what's interesting is that they're doing about three nine in total production. And you ask yourself, well, how can they get so much money? Why are they paying that kind of money? Well, one, they got lenders that will finance it. Two... They want to be able to be competitive. And three, they have competitors that, that will do everything on an EBITDA standard. EBITDA is uh, different from how we normally do these things. Uh, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. But generally, um, practices in the past have all been based on uh, a percentage of profit. Um, these guys come in and they offer uh, 4800000 They give you 70% down in this case, 
uh, which is probably, you know, I tell them, consider that's all you're ever going to get. Uh, you, you may not get paid on this thing. Um, these are uh, somewhat iffy. You're going to have production goals that you have to meet. If you don't meet the production goals, your compensation is going to go down. Um, so you may sell it for 70% and that's all you ever get. Uh, or you may do well. What I typically see is that uh, they come up with production goals that the doctors have never met in the past, um, which makes me suspicious as to whether they can do this. Uh, I guess they can buy, uh, they, they can hire other uh, endodontists. Um, Uh, the way you have to do these things is, uh, as you do in every state, you have to have the doctor, the practice, the, the records. Um, in this case, uh, one of the two doctors wants to be out in three years. He's 67, and he wants to be out by the time he's 70. The other guy's only 35. He, he's happy to work there forever. Uh, so we're still negotiating that, and we'll we'll see where we come out on that next next uh, thank you now this is the one i started to talk about earlier um so this guy walked into my office or he called me about a month ago and he said you know i'm i'm the biggest dso in mexico um i do 200 million a year and i want to get started in california and see how it goes and if I do really well, I may become the next Steve Thorne who owns uh, Pacific Dental. And, you know, I, I hear that from everybody, right? So I take it with a big grain of salt. However, he did show me his, his balance sheet for his practices. And yes, he is doing over $200 million, uh, in in dental uh, fees. Um, that's how much the, the, the dentists are actually charging. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, he has, and this is a hard thing um, for some of the startup DSOs. They don't, if they don't have somebody that is uh, a licensed dentist in that state, um, they're going to have to find somebody or they're going to have to hope that the person that currently owns it and who they're they're going to do the business with uh, agrees that when they sell it, uh, that you have a tag along where you have to go with it and and sell it to whoever. Um, this guy wants to charge a 20% management fee. Um, I said, you're not going to get that right away. Uh, you might get that in a while. Um, he's got the normal employment agreements. Um, this guy, however, is not doing this, at least not now. He's not acquiring these practices on the EBITDA standard. Instead, he's going with the more traditional way that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I, you know, the, the guy is 31 years old. Um, you know, he's a, he's a lawyer in Mexico. Um, he's been doing this for 10 years. Uh, he, he, it was a startup 10 years ago. He's doing 200 million now. I don't know that he can't do that here. And, you know, we'll see what happens, but uh, um, it, it should be a fun run. Uh, next. Okay, this is my last one I want to talk about uh, on DSOs. Um, this involves a... Uh, ortho-based uh, series of practices. They're uh, actually based in Colorado. They have um, something like 50 dental practices in about four states. Um, they're paying a sum that's equal to about 125% of the production, so they're definitely on, on an EBITDA standard. Now, what I found out, these guys, how they were doing it, was they, they were taking the profit. They were taking a percentage of the profit. And I told them, I said, you can't do it that way. And they said, oh, no, no. Somebody from another state got us set up and uh, I'm sure we're you know, doing it properly. So I sent them a copy of the uh, statute. It's 650 of the Business and Professions Code. And it specifically says you cannot 
uh, give profit away to somebody who's not a licensed dentist. Uh, so they are rethinking how, what they're going to do here in California. I think it's kind of on hold. They, they obviously uh, have to uh, change how they've done it. Um, one thing um, I would tell you, um, uh, at least for you sellers out there, uh, you, you probably, you're, you're going to have to carry somewhere between 20 and 40% of the purchase price back and get paid over a period of time. It might be yearly. It could come in one big sum of uh, at five years where you get paid. Um, and, you know, I, I was telling Art earlier, you might want to consider that you may not ever get that money because if they're not doing well, um, they can't, they can't afford to pay it. And they have, believe me, they, they've got plenty of different things in there where they're uh, available to um, uh, discount how much they, they want to charge. Um, so you you really can't expect that you're going to get more money out of this. Uh, okay. Next Hey, okay. Pat, hey, Pat, let me let me jump in on that, that sure. comment. Just make a couple of comments here. So we just had a deal with a specialty practice who sold three years ago uh, on the East Coast. And that practice got a really good multiple cash up front. Um, they left about a million dollars. We call it the mothership. That's the entity that Pat was referring to. Um, which is the entity that you're going to have ownership in, which there's absolutely no guarantee you're going to get anything. So three years later, they did, an, they did a partial exit um, with a humongous private equity uh, group overseas. And my guy got exactly the valuation, which is that million dollars that he had been valued at three years ago. And so he wasn't terribly happy about that. And then he had the opportunity of, did he want to roll that over for the next event? And he, uh, he's made a decision. We don't know what it is. But again, Pat's very, very right. It's 20 to 40%. And you almost have to think of it like you're carrying a note back for your practice if you sell it to an individual. And if you get any money out of it, it's gravy. But I think that the point, Pat, that we want to make is, Every single DSO is different and you got to read the legal documents, right? Yeah. And one of the problems, of course, is you're going to ask them, let me see your financials. None of them want to give them to you. That is uh, a real problem. You, I'm sure have seen that too, Art. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you, you don't really know who you're getting involved with and they're not going to tell you who they are. So uh, you're just going to have to ask around in the industry and try to find out uh, how they're doing. Um, so anyway, so uh, for those of you who are thinking of uh, either buying or selling a dental practice, um, there is really no universal valuation method. Um, there are different ones. I'll, we'll talk about them in a sec. But uh, uh, I think uh, 50 years ago, a lot of people just walked away from their practice. Um, there weren't any dental lenders. Uh, so they really had nobody other than maybe maybe the bank that they had done business with uh, m might extend a, a, a loan or maybe they carried the papers. Um, Wall Street, uh, there was a great article written in 1991 in, in Wall Street. It was like a five-parter. And they said that the historical uh rate of failure in dental practices was less than one percent and uh i think some of the guys uh said hmm so they started to get involved with it uh i know we had a group in the bay area uh that's now owned by wells fargo that got into it uh we also had another group that's now part of b of a they got into it early on um and so, you know, you, you saw people that were willing to, to make loans on dental practices. Uh, next. So the traditional uh, approach uh, that has been used is a percentage of collections. Okay. Um, 
you would look at what the practice did in a year and you'd uh, you you would assign a value that used to be 40 to 85 percent now can be as high as 60 to 90 uh there is uh uh, actually, you're not going to get a lender to go above 90%. Um, another thing you have to be aware of is that not every practice is going to be the same. So if you're running a Medi-Cal practice, you're not going to make this, not going to sell it for the same money that you would for a high-end fee-for-service place. Um, this, the, the, the real problem with this percentage of collections is that it doesn't take into account the profitability of the practice. It doesn't look at the value of, uh, of the equipment. Um, doesn't look at how many new patients you have. Generally, I've found that nobody's really following this very closely. Although you go to a the dental convention and you talk to a broker and they're going to ask you, okay, well, how much did you bring in? And they're going to give you a, a, a number. It might be a big number, but they're going to say, yeah, I can, you know, if you're doing a million bucks, yeah, I can sell it between 700 and 850. Um, and again, it's going to vary according to where you are, but this is not a very scientific way of doing it. So let's look at some other ones. Next. Okay, so the asset approach. Let me tell you a story. I've got a friend. Uh, he was an instructor at UCLA for many years. He still is, actually. Um, he wanted to buy the practice that he had started uh, on behalf of the owner. And so the owner went out and hired uh, a dental uh, appraiser. And I think the practice was doing $850. And so he came in with a $775,000 purchase price. I then got a broker, and I hate to say this, but uh, the broker said to me, what do you want me to value it at? And I was like, come on, it's got to be on the up and up. And uh, he came in at 500. And uh, we then just used those and we negotiated something. What I'm saying is, is that the, uh, the, the asset approach, uh, although it's there on paper, although you can buy Roger Hill's uh, in, uh, book, uh, he's got an actual book out on how you do this. I, it, it, I think it's just too subjective and it doesn't really tell you how you're going to do. Next Okay. Uh, the market approach, it's a good approach. It's similar to when you buy real estate, um, you know, they, the lender can look at the floor plan uh, and they can compare it to other houses that, that have been sold. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you can't do that in dentistry because nobody shares this information. So you don't know. You could have a guy doing a million bucks um, and he could make uh, 200,000 and you could have another guy doing a million bucks and he could be doing 400,000. So you're not, it's not a real hard, uh, fast way of valuing these things. Uh, next. Yeah, they, 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 these are some of the problems. Uh, you know, you're, uh, and Art, you could talk if you want about the tax benefits. Um, you know, if, if you have a if you have somebody that's getting all of the tax benefits, uh, uh, if they're depreciating everything, uh, if they're getting capital gains on everything, <clears throat> they may be doing it at the buyer's uh, 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 detriment. Art, did you want to say? Yeah. Anything? So, so yeah. So the way this works, and I'm going to cover this at length in the next webinar next month in, in November is uh, to make it real simple, you allocate the price. Let's say you sell a practice, Pat, for a million dollars. The general rule is we allocate the vast majority, 95 plus percent to two things. The hard assets, the equipment, the computers, um, you know, the, the, the hard assets. Uh, that usually comes in at between 15 and 20, 25% of the total. Yeah. Um, we rarely, if ever, see an appraisal of the equipment because it's not relevant. It's a negotiation between buyer and seller. That 15 to 25% for the buyer 
they get to they get to pretty much write it off if they want if it's right done back. right in the yeah. year that they buy it. Um, for the seller, they're going to pay tax at the highest federal marginal tax rate, which at the moment is thirty seven percent. So it's better for the buyer to get more in equipment and hard assets and better for the seller to get less because they're going to pay a higher rate. The goodwill portion of this is going to be valued usually in the 70, 70 to 85% of the practice value is gonna to go to goodwill. For the seller, it is generally long-term capital gain and if you're a C corporation, you need to talk to a dental CPA because you can end up paying double tax and get killed on this. And the maximum tax rate for federal purposes is 20%. So if I have $100,000 and I'm arguing as to whether it goes to goodwill or to um, equipment, if I get 100,000 more to equipment, that seller is gonna pay an extra 17% or $17,000 in tax. So it is a big deal. Uh, buyers, you are going to get to amortize the goodwill. Instead of writing it off right away, you have to amortize it over 15 years. So it's a negotiation between the CPAs. Uh, as a CPA and a dental practice broker, I have never, ever allowed a deal to blow up over an allocation. We always figure it out. But it does involve money uh, more for the seller than the buyer. Uh, and, and again, if you're a C corporation as a seller, be very, very careful and talk to a dental CPA because there are landmines in the tax tax law. So that's the yeah. that's how that works. And you know, if you are uh, buying or selling a practice, you really need to have somebody like Art on your team because he's going to know all the ins and the outs that your normal CPA may not even know about. You know, they may not handle the sale of business. Um, so, so you have to be careful. Um, there are other things um, that uh, figure into how you uh, value it. Uh, if the seller is taking a bunch of patients, that's a real no-no. You don't want that happening. Uh, if uh, the seller has to stay on a contract um, because they need income, um, that's going to really impact uh, you because you're not going to get what you're paying for. Next. So <clears throat> what I see most brokers out there ultimately doing, and I see all the dental lenders doing, uh, the income approach. They're going to look at uh, the tax returns. They're going to look at the profit. They're going to allow certain things. There's certain things that they won't allow. Um, uh, they, they come up with a rate um, that's based on uh, how much the practice is actually doing. I put 150 to 300, uh, and even that can, can vary depending on where you are and what you're doing. Uh, but this is the kind of approach that certainly uh, th those of us who do what I do uh, like to see. Art likes to see this, and I know that the lenders like it too. Next. So how do you go about setting up one of these? Um, if you're going through a broker, the broker will have a letter of intent. Uh, that letter of intent will be uh, something that will basically deal with the essentials. Um, you, you get each party to sign it, uh, and then you go and uh, you have your attorney draw up. And, and typically it's gonna be the seller's attorney that draws that up. Um, uh, another very important thing is reviewing the lease. Uh, probably aren't going to get the, the amount of rent changed, but you probably are going to find, if you have somebody who knows what he's uh, doing, uh, that there are things in there that are completely one-sided in favor of the uh, owner of the property. So those, that's a great time to try to get those things out. And I was I would say that uh, I can generally 75% of the time, uh, even more, uh, change things that I see are going to be a problem later on. Um, you know, usually you sign these things because you just want, you like the price and you like what it's going to cost. There's so much more that goes into a lease. Next. It's talking about associates buying in. Um, 
you know, everybody's got their own ideas to how they bring somebody in. Um, I personally think that if you're going to buy in, you got to buy in at 50%. If you buy in at 49% or 40 or whatever, um, you're, you're not going to have any control of. So if you're going to do that, uh, definitely you want to uh, acquire half of it. Um, there is one case up in the Bay Area that I did want to talk about. Um, we're a uh, wonderful client. Uh, he was buying into this uh, practice. Uh, he was doing it on a tiered basis where he was going to buy 20% and then 10. You know, finally he got to 50% after about four years. Um, I he had gotten an appraisal from somebody on the East Coast. Um, he, uh, he Because he was going to acquire the stock, he wasn't getting any depreciation. Uh, and actually I had a... <laughs> phone call with Art on this thing. This is probably 10 years ago, maybe 15. And I said, you know, something's not adding up. And Art said, yeah, the buyer's not getting any depreciation on this. Why would he want to do this? And uh, we we took Art's advice. Uh, we saw that, uh, I think Art did the calculation. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember the steel Art, but- I do, uh, I do remember it, yeah. Yeah, uh, you calculated that he was overpaying by $270,000. Yep. And um, we, sh we showed it uh, to the owner. And the owner happened to be, his best friend was this, this kid's uh, dad. Uh, he was a pretty fair guy about everything. Uh, we got him to essentially get rid of that broker who was putting these crazy ideas in, into his head. Um, and we did it the right way. Uh, and uh, to kind of fast forward, uh, it's been about 10 years. This guy, uh, they opened another practice. They now had four practices. Uh, then the uh, owner last year decided uh, to, to basically sell his equipment, or I'm sorry, sell his interest in the practice. And now my guy owns all these practices and is making well over a million bucks a year. So he's, he's very happy about it. Next. Okay, if you're a seller, a couple of things you really, really want to pay attention to. One is the lease. Typically, the leases say that you're never released from liability. You're going to have to worry about it until you die. I mean, basically, that's how most of the landlords like it to be, because they're spreading what the uh, they're spreading the risk around. Um, so, you know, when I get in one of these, that's one of the first things I look at. Um, uh, and if you're going through a transition, uh, I think it's very, very important to go through and spot. There are probably 20 different things that you want your attorney to uh, spot and, and try to get changed. Next. <clears throat> so... As, as I said, most sellers are not released from liability. They, they're going to have to stay on it. Usually I can get the landlords to uh, release the seller at the end of the time period uh, so that if the buyer exercises an option that might be in there, and by the way, if you go to a lender, they want at least five years before they'll make you a loan. Uh, so you're, you're, you have to have a real um, long-term lease. Um, one thing I'd be careful of, uh, when the landlord can set what the rent is, you don't really have rent, right? This doesn't happen as much as it did 30 years ago, but man, some of the leases I looked at 30 years ago were you know, quite crazy because the landlord and not the tenant decided in their sole discretion just what things, uh, what the rent was going to be. Next. So some other uh, concerns. In California, you're typically uh, going to be asked to uh, allow your name to stay on the door and in the phone book, et cetera, uh, for a period of one year. Uh, there's no actual law that's been passed. Um, uh, so, so it's not like you can call the dental board and find out, but generally nobody really wants the exposure. Nobody wants to get named in a lawsuit for a practice they're no, no longer an owner of. 
Um, you can get this name on door insurance. If you have a good uh, insurance salesman, make sure you talk to them about it. That would keep you out of any lawsuit that was uh, brought against the practice uh, solely as a result of what the buyer did. Um, other concerns um, <clears throat> for a covenant not to compete to be enforceable, it's got to be within a reasonable uh, distance of uh, where the customers actually come from. Um, I did one in Humboldt County, which is not real populated, and uh, we got a 50 mile covenant because there just weren't very many dentists in that area. Um, usually it's going to be 10 or 15 miles uh, from where the practice is, uh, where the seller can't open up a practice or make any money off of practice within that uh, time. Uh, usually it's five years. Um, so, uh, you know, just, just things you, you want to go through and you want to make sure these things uh, end up in there. Next. <clears throat> this, uh, I don't know if I did this with art, but this was, uh, this was a real mess. Um, we had a, um, it was a professional building. Uh, um, the person, there were six doctors that had an ownership in it. Uh, they were paying themselves at uh, a rate that was above what the market rate was. They were doing that because it was a cheaper way. They, they didn't have to pay payroll taxes on it. Um, so they were happy doing that. Uh, we went to them and said, you know, you're charging too much. And they said, you know, uh, we're charging what we're charging. And uh, they also had a, a difficult to deal with attorney. Uh, he didn't want to change anything. Ultimately, and this is the irony of this, is ultimately we've got the seller to carry the 50 cent difference uh, per square foot that uh, she had been paying versus uh, the new buyer. Uh, and she had to pay, pay that for five years. <clears throat> and now uh, that same person is a client of ours. Uh, so I guess she thought we at least handled it. Okay, next. Uh, this guy is still alive. He's 98. Uh, I guess he is planning uh, to live forever. He was very concerned. He, he had signed a document, <coughs> the lease document. And the lease document said that essentially he uh, had to stay on uh, the hook forever uh, as long as this was used as a dental practice because he had a couple of five-year uh, options. <coughs> I said to him, how how long are you planning to live? And remember, he's 93 years old. And he said, I'm going to live as long as I can. So uh, we we went to the landlord. Um, we said, we've got to get this guy off. Um, ne next slide, please. Uh, and ultimately, we did get him off. Uh, they could see that a 93-year-old probably wasn't going to uh, be able to come back and work. Um, this this is an interesting question. The first time I went on Dental Town, which my my son is kind of the king of. Um, <clears throat> somebody had asked a question: When do you tell your staff that you're selling the practice? And I, you know, I saw all kinds of different things, but I said, you know, you don't want to tell anybody anything until the the buyer has essentially waived all of their um, contingencies. Excuse me. Um, you know, they, you, 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 I think everybody worries about job security. Uh, you don't want to have uh, uh, the seller selling and you're suddenly out of a, a job. Uh, so I tell them, um, unlike some of the lenders who say never tell them, uh, I say once you have had all contingencies waived and they put in whatever they have to uh, to make the deal happen, they don't have to get funded, but you do need to uh, let people know that you're selling uh, at some point. And that point should be after this thing has actually been approved. Did you have anything you want to say, Art? Well, you know, th there's pros and cons about all of this. And uh, I have gotten to keep two buyer deposits. One was a million and a quarter sales price where the staff blew the deal up 
um, they kind of found out what was going on. And they basically, when the new buyer came in and met them a week before closing, they made this new buyer so uncomfortable that this new buyer said, I'm not writing a check for a million and a quarter. These people don't want me. And she, it was horrible. So, um, you know, we as brokers, um, a lot of times we'll recommend that we don't tell the seller, the buyer, um, the, the, I'm sorry, the team until the money's in the bank. Uh, telling them when the documents are signed and the deposit goes hard, if you will, uh, is done many, many times. It really, really depends. Um, I will also tell you guys, do not tell, the only person that you need to tell is your spouse and your advisors. Uh, I had one deal where the, uh, and this is a true story, seller selling the practice, Pat, and uh, the, the, the seller told all the relatives, including the 18-year-old niece, and the 18 year old niece calls up the, the front, per, front office and says, hey, Susie, I need to uh, get in for a cleaning before Uncle Rob sells the practice. Right. When they found that out, they confronted the seller and they all quit. And that's the risk that you have in doing that. Yep. So you, you got to know your team, know who they are. We'll talk about that in the next webinar next month. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely risks in, in letting the team know early in the game. Well, I had a client once upon a time, and he had annual retreats, and uh, he had one scheduled in Mammoth. And so he brought the buyer along, and they got to know the buyer real well. Um, and they, of course, uh, went ahead and closed on it. Uh, I've, I've also had people uh, that have looked at the staff and never signed the contract and just basically stole the staff and stole as many patient <laughs> records as they could. So, I mean, you do have to be careful about this. We, we don't want to scare these people, Pat, but it, no. it is. I, I mean, you and I have combined 80 years of experience between the two of us in doing this work. And folks, uh, it, it is, I mean, anything can happen and um, anything could happen. Most transitions, 95 plus percent, go pretty well. Um, but, you know, again, you have to just know your team and know who they are and understand that, that if they get mad at you afterwards, you're doing that to protect their jobs. Because yeah. if it does get out into the community, especially if it's a small community or a rural community where everybody knows everybody that Dr. Wood is selling his dental practice, then people are going to, you know, they could find another dentist, the other dentist in town could find out. And then the next thing you know, is your patients start leaving because you're not going to be there. Right. So you got to be careful. You don't want to be on a slide where Art and I are talking about your sale. No, so <laughs> you don't. We'll, we'll we give you the best those, advice yeah. we can. But uh, anyway, next can you work back after you sell? Generally, uh, you know, you have to have a pretty uh, big practice. I, I'd say 1.2 million as a minimum. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you, you know, what's the buyer really buying? Um, uh, I, I do find that, you know, in my, my experiences that the uh, seller is probably going to leave the practice a lot sooner than he thought because he's not going to get along that well uh, necessarily with the buyer uh, or the buyer may start stealing uh, his, his patients. Um, so I, you know, if you're really planning to work back, um, you know, just know that th there's a good chance you're not going to be able to. Next. What to look for in a lender. Okay, so I could probably tell you who all the lenders are. Uh, it depends on where you are and who they are. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you want somebody that is just dental specific. Um, they, they know their practices. They know what, uh, uh, how to evaluate the practice. They're not going to tell you they're doing that, but that's exactly what they have to do. Um, you, they, they, they're going to have an interest in you being successful. Um, the last thing they want is to have a failure of a dental practice because, you know, it's, if you lose all the goodwill, which you will, if you're a lender, 
uh, then that million dollar loan might be worth uh, 50,000. So uh, they're really going to look at it hard and fast. Now, rates are going up, as you probably are aware. Um, <clears throat> so if you're thinking about doing something uh, right before the end of the year is always a great time. Um, next. Okay, lender red flags. If you don't have a good FICO score, if you don't have at least a 680, you're probably not going to get a lender to make you a loan that uh, uh, is anywhere near what the market rate is. Um, you ought to be checking your own credit. Um, uh, you, you definitely need to try to economize how you're living. Um, I had a guy that had, you know, 800 credit score. He looked perfect. Uh, but he, you know, he and his wife each uh, had very expensive cars and they had a very expensive um, uh, apartment in Westwood. Um, and I couldn't get anybody to approve them just simply because they were spending too much money. Um, so also, if you have a weak financial statement, uh, that's going to be a red flag for your for your uh, lender. Next. Another thing that the lender is going to look at, and they're going to want to see your uh, what your production has been. Uh, they want to see both the buyers and the sellers because they want to make sure that the buyer can actually do the work. Uh, if the buyer has, you know, has gone and uh, worked for a DSO and just done basic uh, drill and fill, uh, he's probably not going to look real good to a, the lender who's trying to sell a, a multi-diverse uh, uh, dental practice because the person probably doesn't have this, the skill to do it. Uh, next. Um, if the lender is questioning something, then you ought to question. I'm, I've said that from day one, that if they have concerns and they're making all the money available, and that's how they do it, by the way, they're going to give you 100% of the purchase price just about every time. So uh, if they've got questions, you ought to have questions. Um, if you see declining revenue, uh, that's a very bad uh, uh, thing to see. Um if the seller has another practice in the area, you probably don't want to buy it. Uh, a lot of times that, that seller is going to ship certain people over to them. Uh, so be careful about that. Next. <clears throat> um, specialists um, may, I mean, if you got somebody who does a lot of um, high-end dentistry and you're a buyer who's never done that, it's probably not the right practice for you. You're not going to know until you actually get in there and see. Uh, if the practice has had a, a lot of staff turnover, uh, you might want to find out why. Um, it could be that the seller is a miserable person and uh, can't keep staff. And uh, if that's the case, um, you know, maybe you go ahead. Um, if you have a high high revenues, uh, but not many patients, it may mean it has many times in the past that the seller is overselling his services, and you may not be able to do that when you get in there. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Medicare uh, uh, situation. Uh, we never know what the governor is going to allow in the way of dental um, uh the, the Medicare program in California. Right now, it happens to be very good. Um, if California ever sees a Republican uh, occupying that, probably, I don't know, uh, 50 years from now, uh, they may cut that back uh, or they might just run out of money. So be careful of that. Next, buyer issues. Yeah, there's nothing like due diligence. There's nothing like getting in there, kicking the tires, making sure that you have your uh, person come in and examine the equipment with you. Uh, you want to make sure you have a good uh, attorney uh, that can really go through it and do a good job, a good accountant that can plan things for you. Um, you know, it's, it's just key to uh, be able to get somebody that really knows what he's doing. Next, 
Okay, buyer issues. Goodwill. Goodwill is, as Arch said, you, you want to get when you're a seller because it is capital gains uh, worthy. You want to get as much allocated uh, to goodwill. Um, buyers, um, you know, you, of course, you want to get goodwill, but you don't want to pay too much for it. Um, but that is really what you're acquiring is the fact that the patient will come back, stay with the practice uh, and, and continue as a uh, patient. Um, um transfer of well you know you can't do this anymore for a while we we're able to uh you know the delta premier issue um where you couldn't substitute the new buyer in we we're able to keep the seller on as the dental director and bill under him but uh that that's essentially been closed down so um uh, next now this is a case i had in long beach um, this guy, you know, we generally, we're going to do three or four drafts of the purchase agreement, right? You got to make sure your attorney, if you're a buyer is reading everything. In this case, my guy came to me, my guy was the seller actually. And he said, uh, I, I want this, the buyer to finish all my, uh, my, my bridge cases. And I said, well, what are you going to give him for that? And, uh, he said, oh, you know, 5,000 bucks. And I couldn't get him to tell me how many he had. So I went ahead and I put it in and we paid the guy the 5,000 bucks. And it turned out he had well over 300 bridges that he had to uh, fill. And many of them, um, uh, you know, I hadn't been paid for. And uh, it was just a complete mess. It ended up being a lawsuit and the uh, buyer got reimbursed uh, about one hundred and fifty thousand for for doing that work. Um, now, what do you want to do as a seller if you've got cases that long term cases? Uh, you want to have a reasonable time period to finish the cases that you have. Um, you don't want uh, to go out too far. Generally, ninety days should be enough. Um, uh, you can't. Uh, if you're doing a dental implant case, uh, you know, where, where the bones have to heal and all that, that's really not part of the same deal. You can't really say, I'm going to come in in six months and finish that. Uh, nobody's going to allow you to do that. Next. Um, associate Dennis, uh, I'll tell you, I had a couple of nightmare cases. One that was in Corona. Um, it was a practice that the owner only managed. The owner didn't do any dentistry there. Uh, he just had this key associate. Um, uh, the associate had no interest in buying the practice, which we thought, you know, that's pretty weird. Why doesn't he want it? We tried to ask him. We could never get him to, to address it. I told my guy, you know, something's going on here and you probably don't want to buy this. My guy was just, you know, hard core about his decision. He said, I'm buying it no matter what. And uh, I don't think I'm going to have any problem. I said, okay, all I can do is tell you what I think. And there's something wrong here. Well, um, about a month and a half after uh, the seller uh, acquired the practice and took over a lot of the work, uh, the buyer suddenly uh, uh, left and the following week, and it was a shopping center, in order to get to the, the seller's case, uh, you had to go buy this uh, other dental practice that was being built out. Well, guess who the associate was? Guess, guess who had just built that out? The associate for the seller. So now, if you, and this happened, if you wanted to go and see uh, you had an appointment at the seller's practice, you'd have to see the, the person who'd been doing your work in another office. And of course, they'd walk in there and say, uh, you know, I'm here. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, associate had to explain how, how this happened and that he now has his own practice. And he essentially took most of the cases. Um, 
another uh, one like that where uh, they had they just had no no agreement whatsoever. Um, this was uh, actually in my wife's hometown in Amityville, Long, Long Island, uh, and the it was a big practice. Um, it probably sold for one and a half million bucks, and there was no uh, covenant of any kind. And by the way, uh, that's one of those states that allows covenants to be enforceable in an employment agreement. Uh, I'd, I'd say probably 46 states allow you to do that. Uh, this is not a state uh, where you could restrict them um, uh, unless you had it in writing. Uh, and of course, uh, there was no, no associate agreement uh, and there was no uh, ability to stop the guy. And of course, uh, and, and, and frankly, um, he just basically had the people call the practice and pull their records and uh, brought it uh, to a place that was two blocks away. And he had a great practice, uh, you know, immediately. Uh, bad, bad case for the, uh, very bad for the buyer in that case. Uh, next. That would we call that the Amityville horror? You knew uh, yes, say, we, right? we would be, yes. <laughs> And so, if, if any of you have ever been uh, a client of my son, Jason's, uh, in the past, um, I used to take him, well, I'm, you know, he's, he's 45 now, so this is 30 years, 35 years ago. I used to take him by the Amityville Horror House, which was about three blocks from my wife's parents' house. And I'd tell him, Jason, if you do that again, I'm going to drop you off and leave you here. <laughs> and that generally would get him squared away for two or three hours. Uh, hey, yes. I want to make a couple of buyer comments just for a second. Sure. Uh, when we do, uh, my, my dear friend and partner, Pam Chamberlain, does accountants due diligence uh, she'll do a couple of things that, that don't have to do with the numbers. Number one, you want to look at the seller's website. Uh, is there a second location on there? Uh, if it is, how close is that second location? If that second location is, you know, in a uh, uh, hundred miles away or 50 miles away and you're in Southern California, it's probably not an issue. You also want to look at the seller's reviews. Okay. If you see glowing five-star reviews, in 99% of the cases, because you know, not too many people get 100% five-star reviews, that's great. If you start seeing, oh, I had to go back and get things fixed and redone and redone and redone, then you've got to call your attorney and say, well, wait a minute, we've got some redo issues be because this could be an issue here. Um, and I would also look on a seller's social media pages, Instagram, Facebook, I mean, all that stuff, because that will tell you about this seller. What, what do we know about this seller? Uh, what, what is he or she involved in? So these are things that you can do before you buy a practice that has nothing to do with the numbers. So I'm sitting uh, in the lovely town of Chicago right now. I've heard of yeah. Chicago. Yes, nice, nice town. Um, we have been here for three days and um, the way we found every restaurant we've been to is, uh, through the internet. Um, we got the ratings. We saw how people rated uh, a particular restaurant. Generally they, they were, uh, right on with what they, they did. Uh, and that happens in the world of dentistry. You're going to have people that go on Yelp and, uh, try to look at what kind of rating that you had. Um, so I, I, you know, I just think you need to do, and you need to maybe hire a consultant to do uh, all of this planning, so that you don't you don't close and find out that you're losing your your patients. Um, another thing I would say is, when you buy a practice, you don't want to change the staff. It doesn't matter if they're getting overpaid or not. Because if people are coming in and seeing you for the first time, they're going to want to see the same people that they've been seeing in the office for years. Uh, so I would not change anybody. I probably wouldn't get rid of anybody for six months if, if I could help it. Uh, I think it just is better for uh, uh, patient retention. Hey, hey, Pat, let me ask you a question because this does come up. We, we as, I'll put my broker hat on. We tell sellers who we represent. Uh, that they should make sure 
that they do not tell their employees, oh, well, I can promise you that the buyer is going to keep your salary and benefits the same. If the, if the employees ask that question, wouldn't the answer be, you know, I, I mean, I would like to hope that he or she is going to do that, but you'd have to talk to them. We've suggested that they keep everything the same, but isn't that, I mean, if the seller says, oh yeah, your salary is going to be the same, and then the, 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 the buyer terminates them, or is the seller liable in a situation like this? Well, you got to be careful how you draft it. My agreements all say that there's no uh, guarantee of employment for anybody. And right. that uh, if people leave, they leave. Some people don't like to read that, but you know, you, you have to be fair. <clears throat> you can't uh, expect the, the uh, employees to stay there if uh, they don't like the doctor or they've reduced their pay or they've done something to change things. So um, I, I go to great lengths to tell them that you can't rely on, uh, you can't rely on the income that's going to come in. You can't rely on the employees to stay. Um, uh, you just have to go at this. Uh, now, granted, 95% of the employees are probably going to stay or 90%. So you're probably not going to have that uh, problem. But, you know, we, we Art and I, uh, of course, have seen that 10%. And it, it can be very ugly. Um, so I'd like to make one more suggestion to sellers. And I, I tell every seller that we represent, when you sell the practice, keep a logbook of what happens after you sell the practice. Uh, we had a scenario in, uh, in Central California uh, I drove up there. We we told the buyer, do everything the same. Don't change everything. The buyer made every mistake in the book and basically ran off all the employees and 80% of the patients and then sued the seller. And I said to the seller from the beginning, I said, you need to keep a log. Every time one of your employees comes to you and says, buyer did this. Every time you see something, every time a patient calls, blah, 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 write it down, the date and exactly what was said. Because counselor, um, getting in front of a litigator in a legal action, if a buyer sells you, uh, sells, uh, sues you, um, I have been an expert witness 15 to 20 times, probably 15 times. Uh, litigators are tough, aren't they? They are. And um, I was going to talk about litigators uh, here in a sec. Well, I'll um, let, let you do but, that. But you, you brought up a, a, a good point, and that is that Litigators can make a uh, a case out of nothing, and you know they're going to fee you to death. Uh, you just have to be careful um, who you're dealing with. Um, if we go to the next panel, that may be, yeah, okay. So these are just red flags. Um, we we had a practice that sold in Fresno. Fresno is not really. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to sell a practice there. Um, uh, in this case, um, the seller said, I'm not going to change anything in the purchase agreement. You take what the, the buyer did and uh, the, the broker did, and, and that's all I'm going to do. Um, and I told my guy, I said, don't buy it. And it turned out he did not buy it. Um, he then went to his backup buyer and he said, OK, we, we won't change anything. Uh, the practice was closed within six months of that because uh all the protections we wanted the buyer to have, this guy refused to do any of it. And, uh, you know, you just, it, it, and another thing, I mean, if you're going to hire somebody, make sure that they've done this, your accountant, your, your lawyer, that they've done this many times. Um, this Solano case was an interesting one in that it was a pedo practice. <clears throat> At the last second, the attorney came to me who was representing the seller and said, uh, cause I wanted him to say, you're not going through any audits. And, you know, he said, well, you know, we don't know if somebody's out there auditing us. I said, okay, that you know about, and, you know, okay. Well, finally he said, you know, we, we might have a routine audit going on. Well, little did we know uh, that the, uh, state was uh, auditing him and ultimately he went to jail for 14 years. He was committing uh, malpractice fraud. And, uh, um, you know, my, my guy bought it 
uh, and then he, he had to sue him and get some of his money back. Uh, but, you know, if somebody says, you know, I'm not, I have a problem saying I, I don't have uh, audits going on, you should be very, very suspicious. Uh, the next one, the San Joaquin one, um, this is that famous case 20, 25 years ago. Um, the the gentleman had hired a bunch of SC, UCLA grads, uh, first job. Um, the uh, seller said, the seller's wife said, don't worry about uh, your record keeping. We'll do it for you, um, which, of course, is a, a major violation if you're not doing that. Um, anyway, make a long story short, uh, uh, my guy was going to close on this thing. Uh, he was going to close on a Friday. Um, and then his bank said, we won't have the money available until Tuesday. So he didn't. Uh, meantime, uh, his all of his practices were raided on a Monday morning. Uh, they took something like 18 uh, dentists out, some in handcuffs. Uh, they essentially went after their licenses because they weren't doing what they're supposed to, which is, you know, you, you shouldn't be letting the seller's wife fill in what you did. You know what you did. Uh, and so they, they learned the hard, hard way. And two of the guys um, actually, they lost their, their licenses. They came to me and said, set me up as a DSO. And I said, well, you know, I can do that, but you might have people looking at you because of your status. You lost your license. Um, I set them up and actually they worked out very well. Uh, they still have the practices and um, you know, there are, there are other things you can do uh, when you buy a practice. Um, and in this case, it, it, it turned out well. Uh, next. Uh, referral sources. Um, if you have, uh, if you're in a specialty practice, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you have a chance to meet with all the the referral sources. Uh, I always put down who who has uh, made five or more uh, referrals in the last uh, three years. Um, sometimes I, I say three uh, uh, or more in the last uh, three years. Um, you know, you, you want to know who is actually doing it, and then you want to set up a series of meetings uh, between the seller and these people after you close so that the buyer gets to actually meet uh, uh, the, the people that have been referring and, you know, they get a feel good uh, 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 out of it. Um, another thing that, you know, this is kind of hard to even talk about it, uh, but if you have a, a high percentage of an ethnic group, Chinese speaking, they could be from the Middle East, um, uh, it could be from just, a, uh, I won't say what churches, but I will say there are a couple churches that come to mind um, where people are getting a high percentage of their patients from, and, you know, they'll just follow the, the seller to wherever he goes to. Um, I had one case in San Francisco, and I, fortunately, I talked her out of it. She was, uh, uh, she had been born in Iran. Uh, she was educated here. She was going to buy this practice that was in the heart of uh, the the um, oh, uh, on, uh, it, it basically the, all of, all of the patients were Chinese, Chinese speaking. Some didn't even speak uh, uh, English. Uh, and I said, "Why would you buy that?" How are you going to even talk to these people? Um, and ultimately, um, I, I got a broker up there uh, uh, to also talk to her. And uh, he ended up selling her another practice uh, where, coincidentally, they had a lot of uh, Iranians and Persians and, and whatnot. And this practice was bought by somebody that actually spoke uh, Mandarin. So it, it worked out. But God, if she had closed on that thing, uh, it would have been a nightmare. Okay, next. Covenants, you know, a lot of times you hear covenants aren't enforceable. Um, that's just not right. Uh, covenants are enforceable, but they're limited. 
you can get it when you buy a practice because you're acquiring the goodwill of that practice. Uh, so don't let somebody tell you you can't have a covenant. You can always have it in that. Where you can't have it is in an employment agreement where uh, it says you can't practice within 10 miles of here. Um, you, you can't do that in the state of California. Uh, you can have a covenant that says you're not going to uh, take the patients, uh, that you're not going to solicit the patients, uh, that you're not going to solicit uh, the, the employees of the practice when you leave. Those are all enforceable in California. Um, so you need to get with a, a creative attorney that can make sure that you have that kind of stuff in there. Next. Yeah. Um, some more buyer and seller issues, um, and this is specifically when you're dealing with a, an attorney, you want to get somebody that does a lot of dental practice sales. You don't want to have a family member or a friend do it. Um, you really don't want to have a litigator involved in it because, my God, the things they come up with. Um, you really just you want to ask around, talk to the brokers, find out who they like, uh, find out who they're seeing a lot of the time uh, doing these deals. Um, but you really don't want to bring somebody in that doesn't know anything about it. Um, when you do, um, you know, I, I hate to say this, but uh, I'll use a different form. Uh, if they don't have somebody that I know uh, and see what they pick up on. And I just sold one like that. And they maybe had three three changes in the whole contract. Uh, it's because the attorney did not know uh, what he was doing. Next. Okay. Um, you... I guess the, the thing I would say to any of you sellers is uh, you want to make sure that you know what's in your lease. Um, you may have problems later on with the lease where you're going to be liable for, for something uh, where you don't necessarily have to be. Um, you may want to bring somebody in and you can't because of the way it's written. Um, so just get somebody who knows how to look at it, knows how to do uh, what should and should not be in there. Um, you don't want to use a standard lease. Standard leases uh, are written by the attorneys for the landlord. They're not your friends. They're if, if they say they're using a, uh, a standard lease, you really have to have somebody go through that and take out the bad things because there are going to be bad things. Last thing on this page is uh, a new lease versus assuming an existing lease. The landlord typically is going to want the land, land, landlord really has two issues. Um, do they want to let the seller off the hook if something bad happens? Because if they write a new lease, uh, the seller is not going to be on that lease. So I, I would say most of them really uh, are not going to want to write a new lease. Uh, whereas you as a seller, you want to be off that as soon as you can. So, you know, just know that there are different ways to, to de deal with that. Um, and uh, be happy to talk to you guys about this uh, just by call calling my phone number at the beginning of this outline. Did you have something right? Art? Yeah, Pat, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about the landlords. You have to remember doctors that if you are buyers, if you are buying and sellers too, if you're selling or buying a practice that has three years, five years, eight years remaining on the lease, that landlord has no motivation to hurry up and get this done for you, especially the bigger landlords, because they've got a guaranteed income stream from the seller that, you know, th there's no motivation for the landlord to, to do this. So if, if buyer and seller are saying, well, we got to get this done and you know, I'm moving and I'm quitting my job and all this stuff, the landlord has no motivation. So when we tell the landlord, which we normally don't do until we get into, at least I don't do, until we get into the contract phase, you, you need to have a conversation with this landlord and say, listen, I'm looking at closing this in 30 or 45 days. Um, is that going to be an issue? Pat and I just dealt with a deal uh, in South Los Angeles County, where the landlord was a huge landlord. 
they had just taken over ownership of the building. The prior owner was the dentist's friend, was another dentist for 30 years. And now the new landlord, it took an extra two and a half months because the landlord was unresponsive. Absolutely. One other thing, sellers, that I, I do want to point out. When a landlord says, what is the sales price of your practice? And can I see a copy of the purchase agreement? Counselor, what's the answer to that question? No, you can't see it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because once a landlord knows, oh, well, that's interesting. You're going to be selling your business for a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars That landlord immediately says, well, I'm going to become your partner in this sale. It's true. <laughs> it's true. We, I, I, do, do we have this slide coming up with we that do. particular conversation? Uh, Stacy, you want to take us to the next? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. This isn't quite that. I, I'll get back. Yeah, we'll, to we'll get to that one. I, I know which slide we're talking about. I know. I, I know. Uh, options. Um, often these things are written as being personal to you, the the seller. Uh, you need to go through the lease, and you need to make sure that it's not personal and that they can be fully assigned. You want to make sure that the rent is not going to go up because, believe it or not, the buyers lender is going to look at the lease and if they see that you can <clears throat> the landlord can can bump the rent they're not going to be real happy about making that loan so next okay these are some of the ways these guys landlords get around this stuff um uh, the and and i have a slide uh that's going to go along with one, this um if, if the landlord um can change the the uh, base rent because there's going to be an assignment of 50 percent or more um you, you don't want anything to do with it you probably want, just want to run away from that practice right then um yeah it, at a minimum you have to get that taken out of and that would be the kind of thing uh that your dental attorney should be looking for uh the recapture clause is also something that we see in there uh, where if you sell the practice, they have the right to say, uh, no, I, I don't want that guy in here, so I'm, I'm not going to assign it. Um, and then we talked about uh, personal options uh, can be a real problem. You don't want these to be per personal. Uh, you, want, you want the lease to be fully uh, assignable. Next. Hey, Pat, can I jump in and ask you a question here? Yeah. So you and I have both run into the situation where a seller comes to us and says, I've got three months left on my lease, or I've got six months left on my lease. What do I do? Do you recommend that they go to the landlord and, and negotiate a, an extension with options? Or do you say, you know what, just let the buyer negotiate the new lease? How, how does that work? What do you say? Well, the buyer obviously has the greatest incentive to get the best terms that he can. So yeah, if I represent the buyer, I want to be talking to the landlord and I want to see what I can change. And, you know, you, you may decide I don't want to do this because this landlord is not a very friendly guy uh, and won't give me the things I want changed. Um, so, you know, I would say if I represent the buyer, I definitely want to be talking to the landlord before we close. Uh, next slide. Okay, this yeah. is well. This isn't quite it. This is, uh, but it is. Uh, oh, well, right. Okay. It, I know the name. We know the name best because uh, his name is Bob Best, and he's a huge landlord. Uh, and we'll talk about him in a second. But he uh, back in I think this is 1985. He had a clause that he put in this dry cleaners contract where it said that. Um, you would have to, if you sold the practice, uh, you'd have to give him three quarters uh, of the amount that was paid. Um, and, you know, the, the Court of Appeals looked at it and said, you know, landlord, you haven't done anything here. You haven't put any tenant improvements here. You have nothing here that you've actually done other than own the building. So we're not going to give you an award that would include goodwill uh, or the value of the business. Uh, and so uh, the, the, uh, this gentleman was able to get out of that. And uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is you know, just kind of uh, uh, explaining it. 
uh, you know, a lot. This is only a California case, by the way. Uh, this is not the law in other states. So um, you do want to have somebody who who is familiar with this. Now let's let's talk about on the next panel, Stacy. Okay, here it is. So Art got this listening. Really fine, fine guy. Um, and I think he got he, you did you you sold the price. Um, for a million one hundred thousand, yeah. uh, he was doing a million four hundred and fifty thousand. Um, his wife uh, had already moved to Indiana with the daughter, who was going to some special uh, volleyball school. Yeah. Um, he had his his house uh, in Coto de Casa was in escrow. Um, yeah. He had gotten loan approval. Um, the lease had a year and a half to go. It had two five-year options. Um, the landlord, who happened to be Mr. Best, said, I'll, I can't stop you from having an assignment of the one and a half years remaining, but I can stop you from picking up on the options. And these guys were impossible to deal with. Um, they wanted $100,000 uh, if they did this. Uh, it was just blackmail is all it was. You couldn't yep. ever get them on the phone. Um, later, I was teaching class and uh, I brought this up and somebody there said, yeah, I, I, I know the best. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm best friends uh, with one of his kids and dad is a real, you know what? Um, anyway, we settled it. Uh, we paid him an extra $50,000 to do it. Uh, you know, I mean, it was crazy to do it, but uh, my, our guy was in a very bad place and had to get out of there as soon as he could. Um, so, so, Pat, I want to throw a couple of things at. Number one, this doctor was a CPA client of mine. I helped him set his practice up 15 years earlier. I remember the conversation. This was, I think, maybe even before I met you, which is a long time ago. And I said, doctor, you need to spend some money with an attorney to review the lease that you're going to sign because he started the practice from scratch. He was the first dentist in that town, which goes way back. And he says, no, I don't have the money. And, and the, the landlord, I'm just going to sign the lease. So when we went to go look at assigning this, this is what happened. I delivered. Now, I will tell you, folks. Uh, I don't need to give kudos to my uh, my colleague here on this on this uh, webinar. He negotiated this down from 100 to 50,000. I did not. I delivered the check to the landlord. Physically drove over to Costa Mesa and did this. And I said to the guy, it wasn't Mr. Best. I said, "You are evil human beings." And he smiled. He said, "Is there anything else, sir, that I can help you with?" And that was it. Yeah, that's exactly. I tell this story all the time. I, I'll probably tell it next month in the lecture I talk about. It. Yeah, the, well, um, I'll give you a follow up to this. Oh, sure. Uh, about a year later, I think it was Thanksgiving. I was going out to play the golf course there uh, that Art and I have played at. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop over there and just uh, see if I can buy a hamburger, et cetera. It's a good size shopping center. Well, the dental practice was closed. And I said, why? Wow, that's very strange that it's closed. I got the whole story later, but uh, <clears throat> I happened to have Mr. Best's cell phone number. So I called him. And of course, it went to a voicemail. And I said, you know, for a big landlord, you're not doing a very good job in that large center because it looks like 75% of your tenants have left. Um, you might want to think about how to draw a reasonable lease up instead of blackmailing everybody. Next, next uh, slide. Um, this was one my son handled. Um, oh, one more thing uh, on the last one. Um, the landlord had the right, because after a year and a half, to raise the rent, and they did. They raised it by a buck and a half a square foot. Um, which basically drove the landlord out of being able to make a profit. And uh, uh, her boyfriend happened to be somebody that, you know, we, we de deal with a lot in the dental industry. And he, he was just all over her to close. And so they did. And unfortunately, she ended up in bankruptcy. 
Okay, this one, um, my son, son handled it. <clears throat> he got everything approved. He had working capital. Uh, seller was getting out of town. Uh, he had nine years to go on, on the uh, uh, current term plus a five-year option. The options were assignable. Uh, no excess consideration language. Seemed like a slam, slam dunk. Next, next panel. However, it said that if you asked for an assignment, the landlord had the right to deny the assignment or recapture the assignment. So uh, we went to the landlord and we said, well, you don't really want an empty spot, do you? And he said, yeah, I, I, I do. I can get more money. Well, we ended up having to pay uh, uh, a fair amount of money to get a waiver. It wasn't 50,000, but it was, I thought it was excessive. But, you know, you don't have time to go to court on all these things. You know, you want to get it done now. And so he, he would have won on it, but uh, I don't think he wanted to pay all the money it cost. Okay, next slide. Yeah, just, uh, I'm going to do some quick summaries. Um, so if I were a buyer, I'd go out and I'd find a good dental lender that does a lot of these. I'm not talking about some guy at the corner bank. I'm talking about the B of A's and uh, the other ones out there that do this. Um, I'd hire somebody to do your due diligence, particularly if it's a, a large one. Uh, we know and love a certain woman that, although she lives in Florida, uh, she's out here a lot uh, and, and continues to do the due diligence. So you know what you're getting uh, getting involved with. Her name is Kathleen Johnson. And you will meet her in December if you come on to that webinar. And she's done, as I said, over a thousand of these and will give you all the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, she, on the management side of your practice. Yeah, she will find everything in there. And if she says, don't buy it, don't buy it. Next slide. Sellers issue. Um, if any of you are planning to sell your dental practice in the next couple of years, you really need to look at the assignment clause and see if you're going to have a problem. It's usually going to be buried somewhere in the middle of it. It'll say assignment and just see. I mean, if they have some of these things we're talking about, um, you need to talk to the landlord now and get the landlord to get you uh, off of that at some point in time. Again, they'll typically let you off at the end of the current term unless, you know, you've got a year or less to go, in which case they want you to stay on uh, make sure that you get somebody like Art, uh, a guy who's a great uh, CPA and can take a look at your taxes. Um, he can look at uh, your, your, what your payroll has been, uh, how much money is coming into the practice. Um, and then you, you need to go out and hire these people, the broker, the attorney, et cetera. Uh, and make sure you have the, the right person and, and that you're comfortable uh, with the, the people that you're hiring. Next. Um, this really isn't, this is where I, I, I probably should have taken this out. Um, Delta, we had a meeting with the head guy for California years ago, maybe 2016 when they, they were changing this. And uh, they said, you know, we just can't pay uh, Delta Premier uh, fees anymore. We we got to cut everybody down. And the amount that they cut it down by is at roughly 30%. And he said, you know, um, I know we have to get the insurance commissioner to approve this change in the contract, but, you know, we think we'll get it. And for a while, they were actually kind of hoodwinking uh, people uh, into letting them know that they, 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 um, uh, we're, we're not going to become income, uh, getting income from Premier. Uh, they could only do it on their PPO. Uh, now they've basically taken it all away and you can only be a PPO uh, Premier, uh, I'm sorry, PPO uh, person with Delta. So it's, uh, it's sad, uh, but it's just the way it is. Next. Yeah. And bear in mind, um, and no offense to you, Art, because uh, you actually do your own due diligence, but the brokers really don't have a duty to do due diligence. That's totally up to the um, buyer to do that. Um, 
seller's got to be honest with you. Uh, and you try to get as many reps and warranties as you can, because, you know, th there are bad times the, that, that occur. Um, but just make sure you get a good team working for you. Next. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if we can go back, uh, Stacy, to page one, the very first page. Yeah, and and Stacy, can you put my contact information in the chat for everybody? Um, I think I sent you a text with that. Um, if you can do that, it's uh, I, I, if you could put that in the chat. If anybody wants to get a hold of me because they're not on these yeah. slides, Pat's information is here. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're here to help. Um, so. Uh, Pat, any... I just uh, uh, go ahead. I, I just had a couple of questions that, that sure. came up that I wanted to ask about. Talk real quick. We've got about we've got about ten minutes left that we can go through some other things. Talk about sellers carrying paper. What's the risk of doing that? It's very substantial. Uh, a, you're going to be in a subordinate position to the lender on the practice. Um, so if they default to that lender, all of your security goes away. Uh, you also don't want to be the person carrying the paperback um, because you really don't have any security there. Uh, so if you're going to, if you are going to carry paper, um, you better get to know who the buyer is and what his, his sense of ethics are, et cetera. But generally speaking, you don't want to carry paper. There are people, there are lenders out there that are going to make 100% loan. And uh, 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 it's the only way I would do it if I was buying a product like this. Another question is, this has come up. And if I find this out as a broker, I will terminate my listing agreement with the seller. Talk about a seller that does not collect co-payments. Yes, that's, and that has found its way into every contract that I write. Um, if you have got patients that are coming in, and it's a lot of them, um, you want to know that they're collecting everything that they built. And if people start coming into the practice who have always gotten uh, a, um, a, a discount, if you will, uh, they're not going to come back there if you start charging them the full fee. So you want the seller to say, either I do or I don't. Uh, waive copays, uh, and if you find out that they do, um, you need to determine whether uh, that's the right practice for you. Um, I've seen a lot of litigation over the years on this thing, uh, where somebody didn't put it in there, and you find out that the uh, the fixed fee price that you thought you were getting uh, from every patient uh, you're not able to get because uh, the seller had routinely waived those things. And I think, Pat, I want to make the to kind of put a bow on this whole webinar. You did a great job. Thank you so much for all your expertise and, and, and all the case studies you, you came up with today is to my sellers, uh, honesty, integrity and transparency. Um, you know, the truth will set you free. We disclose everything that we need to disclose. Lean on your advisors. But if you've got some, um, you know, secrets that you don't want anybody to know that a buyer is then going to get hurt by. Uh, you you got to think twice about that. And buyers, I want you to be aware as a broker, as a CPA, as someone who's been involved in a thousand, literally a thousand transactions as a broker, CPA, consultant, it is buyer beware. In other words, you buyer have the obligation to ask questions, to ask for information, uh, don't ever let a, a seller tell you, well, why do you, or a broker tell you, why do you need that? Well, I, I've had, I've had brokers say, well, well, why do you need that? Because my client's going to write a million dollar check to your client. And I understand you have a commission coming, but we're not writing that million dollar check until we get the answer to these questions. And if your sellers mm -hmm. are not forthcoming with a lot of information that you're asking for, that's reasonable. Okay. Uh, that, that's reasonable. I need tax returns. I need financials. I need payroll information. I need production reports. I need um, uncompleted treatment plans. If they're not forthcoming, then if I'm a buyer, I, I would walk away from that because it's just, why are they, what is the possible reason 
that they're not doing it. And also, if there's an associate in there and they're not buying that practice, why not? Something's why not? going. So ask the questions. Um, uh, Pat, well, do you have any final comments? Because I, I mean, we did this pretty good. It's five to eleven well, uh, here no. in California. I uh, I agree with everything you just said, Art. Um, You're required by law to do that. You know that. What's that? You're required by law to agree with everything I say. You know that. Oh, of course, of course, and of course I do. Um, <laughs> No, I, I would uh, look hard at a practice. Uh, I would ask every question you can think of. Uh, and if you find that either the broker doesn't want to do it, uh, he may he or she may be just trying to close the deal and get paid. Uh, and you know they know they don't have to look at these things. Uh, if they do know about something, they have to tell you. But um, I would say maybe a third of the brokers out there uh, are not going to disclose things to you. Um, art and company are maybe the best in the state. Uh, and there are others that are great. Uh, there's, and there's some bad ones too. So, uh, but yeah, you, you have to find out everything you can about, about it before you buy it. Counselor, thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to remind everybody, please register for our webinar on November the 4th. Um, total practice makeover, increasing profitability in your dental office. And then on November 11th, you're going to get me for two hours, along with my partner in our practice sales business, Dr. Bogdan Madurowicz. And we're going to get more into the woods about valuation, tax issues, what do buyers need to be looking for, what do sellers need to be looking for. Not going to get into the legal issues because we, uh, we did that with one of the best dental attorneys in the country today. Uh, so November 4th and November 11th, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, please register. And again, remember, doctors, if you didn't register for if you don't register um, for these future webinars, we won't be sending you the links. If you do, we'll send you the links if you can't be there. Also, December 2nd on um, taxes and December 9th will be the third webinar that we do with uh, consultant Kathleen Johnson. And she will talk about um all the management things you buyers and sellers should be looking at. So Pat, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I value your expertise. I value your friendship and the fact that I can pick up the phone and call you with pretty much any issue. And you usually have the right answer for me most days. And um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor and privilege of your time today. Um, and if you need any help, Pat's number is up there. My number is in the chat. 657-279-3243 or email me at Ide Bailey, I'm sorry, A. Wiederman, W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at idebailey.com. Uh, everybody have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, I am headed off to Miami tomorrow to our National Dental CPA meeting. I helped form the Academy of Dental CPAs um, 22 years ago and we meet twice a year and I get to see my friends and we actually have a section, Pat, uh, on um, DSOs we're going to talk about because there's a really? lot of that stuff going on. So right. I will be a lot smarter by the end of next week and when I talk to you on the you 11th will. than I am today. Everybody, thank you very much. Thanks. Stacey, thank you so much for everything you and your team at our firm, Ide Bailey, does to help us with these webinars. You're a you know top notch. Uh, can't thank you enough. And uh, everyone, have a wonderful weekend. And on behalf of my good friend and colleague, Pat Wood, uh, we're going to sign off. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey,